Hey everyone, let's play the Broken Cask Society one player. The Broken Cask Society is a follow-up to the Broken Cask tabletop game. However, in the Broken Cask, you played as an innkeeper. As a part of the Broken Cask Society, you will journey and explore to find the greatest inns in the land and then enjoy those inns as a patron. The game is for one or more players, and I've already posted a video with my friend Matt if you want to see how the game is played with two players. In this video, I'm going to show you how it works with one player. The rules are quite simple and more or less the same if you're playing with one person instead of a group. As you can see, I've got myself set up here on Owl Bear Rodeo. All the stuff you see on the screen is a work in progress. The final stuff is being worked on right now by our layout artist, extraordinaire Jacob Hunt. But some form of this will be in the finished package. I've got my phase marker here. I've got the inn I'm going to visit here. I've got my little player image here. Today I will be playing the pilgrim. So I went ahead and I've skipped much of the setup. I've already got my playbook filled out. I'll be playing as Zebo the troll pilgrim. We'll talk more about him in a second. I've also already chosen an inn. When you play during the journey phase, you can choose to roll random tables to create your own inn. Or there are three sample inns in the book. Or you can even go to shorelessskies.com to visit the great ledger of inns, which has tons of inns. Well, maybe not tons. It has lots of inns <laughs> made by players just like you. Now, the egret and infant is one that is in the book. So once that book is released, there will be a nice picture of it, along with some description to help you to visualize this book. So normally you would set up your character and then roll to find which in you're going to. But for the sake of time, as I want this to be a relatively brief video, I've got it all set up already. We begin things with the prepare phase. And just like it sounds, the prepare phase is your character preparing to leave on their journey. And if you watch the video of our two player game, you'll see that the role playing is you and your partner or whoever is in your group kind of playing off each other because there is no GM. With one player, it's entirely up to you. You could just let the dice tell the story as you go along and just enjoy a relaxing, cozy evening of gaming. Or maybe you want to journal or write as you go and as things pop up. The choice is totally yours. The gaming police are not going to kick down your door if you do it the way you want to do it. So for me, I'm going to narrate a little bit as I go. I generally like to kind of tell the story as I play. Uh, but like I said, I don't want this video to be over long. So my descriptions are going to be a little bit brief. The one thing you won't see on the screen is the list of tables. This is located in the Broken Cask Society book, the PDF. And it's also a free download from shorelessguys.com. You can print it out or use it on a screen like I'm doing here today. Uh, but what this does is it creates the random element. If you played the first Broken Cast game, you know that much of the action was generated by a 2d6 table. Broken Cast Society uses much the same system. There's just a few different tables, and I'll kind of talk through those as we go. If you happen to have a copy of the tables, you might want to get that out so you can refer to it as we play today. So as I said, we begin things in the prepare phase. Zebo is a pilgrim, which means he is used to travel. He has lived a relatively quiet life, as trolls often do, and then one day he decided he wanted to become an adventure seeker. He likes to present himself as being a classy, respectable member of the Broken Cask Society, but as his travels and as a troll, it's hard for him to keep his clothes quite clean. So his clothes are a bit worn out, he's a bit shabby looking, he's a little bit um, sensitive about it, let us say so I've given him the vengeful trait. However, as a society member, he must comport himself a particular way. And one of those ways is by preparing with dignity. And so the preparation table is not actually a random table. You can choose which one you want. And I think what I'm going to do is make merry for one point of mirth. So Zebo, he's a bit of a soloist, uh, which is appropriate for our game today. He's a bit of a lone wolf. And... Um, most of our stories, my stories in the Broken Cask Society, I should say, you can do what you want, begin in some sort of large city here in our generic fantasy world. And I imagine that Zebo has a small house somewhere 
in the downtown area. He keeps to himself. He doesn't have a lot of possessions. Most of his money goes to paying his broken cask society dues and the other necessaries for engaging in a life of travel and leisure. Um, however, one thing that he keeps around at all times is um, a few bottles of this special dwarvish port that he really fancies. And so the night before he's to set out, he sits at the table. He gets out a good book that's going to prepare him to travel. He has a nice port and has a nice evening to himself. So this may not be your version of making merry. Maybe you, your characters are going to have a big old party before they go. But for our friend Zebo here, this is a good enough evening. And so what I will do is mark a point of mirth. We'll talk about mirth in detail later. But for now, all you need to know is that it's basically uh, a resource you can accrue and spend to activate your basic moves, which are down here. And we'll talk to that when we get there. So now we're going to move out of the prepare phase. Um, well, we're still in the prepare phase. We're going to move out of the prepare step into the departure step uh, where we leave town and uh, see what happens. So normally there would be a whole in creation phase where you and whoever you're playing with goes and visits the Broken Cask Society house, rolls a few dice to find out where you're going. Um, but from our purposes today, we already know where we're going. I've chosen the Egret and Infant. It is a prestige level six in. It's a post stop in a charming village in the mountains. It's going to take us two days to get there. We'll talk more about appearance and the staff later on. Some of these are for effect and some of them do have a mechanical value. Foremost of which is the days of travel. So it's going to take us two days of travel through the mountains. And that means we're going to have two adventures. So the next morning, Zebo has a stout cup of coffee, packs his bags, pops by the Broken Cask Society house, which is this big sprawling manor because it's early and it's a weekday. No one's about. Most people are still nursing their hangovers. So he pops by to say hello to the intern and then goes on about his merry way. And we begin to leave town, which will trigger our departure event. But let me talk about the robust, famous, and unpaid internship system of the Broken Cask Society. In the appendix of the book, you will find a few rules to help you tweak your solo game if that's your fancy. Some of you will just want to play solo with two characters. Some of you will want to apply some of these rules if you find the game to be a bit challenging. For your first session, I recommend just kind of playing it vanilla. And then if you find you're having difficulty or you just want to change things up a little bit, you can go with these rules. The reason why I'm saying it now is because I mentioned the intern. And one of those options is to choose an intern or create an intern as kind of a hireling. So rather than playing two full characters, you just have an intern who can give you a bonus from time to time uh, as you're the only one playing. You don't have any other players at the table to assist you with the roles. The other option is the extreme training regimen of the Broken Cask Society, which basically allows you to level up for free, again, to boost your stats and to make it a little bit easier on you if you're finding that the um, perils of the road are a bit much. I'm not going to do that right now, but I did want to mention it. And so Zebo sets off, and I have a look at the depart table. We're going to roll 1d6. I've rolled a 1. It says, a loved one offers their blessing. Who are they? Take one point of mirth. So I'm going to go ahead and mark that point of mirth, lest I forget. And our good boy Zebo, he um, does have a few friends in the city. I imagine he left Troll Country some time ago to make for the big city and become a fancy member of the Broken Cask Society. So he may not have any family present, but he has befriended a few half-orcs in the society, you know. And so I think we're going to get a visit um, from society lead, not society lead, but from the society founder, who is a half-orc. And just as Zebo is about to leave the Broken Cask Society House, the founder steps up to him and says something like, it's good to see a troll among us, and I wish you all the best while you're on the road. Maybe not a very poetic blessing, but a blessing nonetheless, and it fills Zebo with a certain sense of pride. And with that, we leave, heading northwards out of town and out into the mountains. Soon enough, the road begins to go from a finely paved thing up to, to a much more rough, a much more rocky dirt trail. And the elevation begins to change dramatically. This is our first day of travel, which means we're about to have our first adventure. 
So whenever we are to resolve an adventure, what we do is we roll first to find out what time of day. And this is kind of cosmetic. Uh, so it um, is not necessary, but I find it helpful to feed the narration a bit, if you will. Or one means it's dawn. So I'm going to say... Yeah, that works. So shortly after the break of day, as Ebo sets out on the road, something is going to happen. So just like the first Broken Cask Society game, we have a 2d6 table. I flipped in my pamphlet or my, my document of tables to the mountains, and I'm going to roll. And because it's 2d6, we add them together to get a 9. It says, Mountain Goat Strike. How do you defend yourself? All right. So just as Zebo reaches the foothills of the mountain at the first sign of a rocky outcropping he hears a terrible Bleh! and there glaring down at him is a pair of really salty goats who have clearly missed their breakfast and are looking for trouble so this calls to mind our pilgrim moves they may not be able to see them too clearly because i was really smart and chose a dark font but uh, the pilgrim has the option of choosing friend to beast which gives them a boon whenever they test involving a animal i did not do that so zebo is going to have no help um, what i did choose was leave none to waste and this is going to be useful because as you can see i only have so much morale which i forgot to bubble in and only so much gear and only so many mirth slots so this gives the pilgrim who's used to um conserving while they're on long travel they can have a little extra so this could be good because i've already got two mirth and that's a hot commodity in the broken cask society uh, but I am not a friend to be, so this is not going to help me. So these goats are looming down at Zebo. Um, this is a body test. How would Zebo handle this situation? So again, if you're playing on your own, this is just between you, your imagination, and the story you want to tell. It's a chance for you to flex some um, some of those good brain muscles and just have a good time. And so um, I think Zebo tries to comport himself a certain way as i've said but when it comes to animals or like inanimate objects he's not afraid to express emotion so he sets his pack down takes a big lung full of air and then roars at these goats as i move my tracker down because i forgot to do that we're on our first adventure here okay so he's gonna we're gonna roar at them now this is a b5 test so the way this works is i roll 1d6 and my target number is five. B stands for body, so it's a body test. The body um, stat for the pilgrim is zero, so this is essentially a naked roll. But I do have some bonuses I can take. I think I'm gonna go ahead and spend my first point of mirth to trigger this consideration move. All right, so like I said, the point of mirth is um, a generic bonus currency that you can spend on any of these basic moves. It could be a re-roll, it could be a flip, it could be um, triggering a move without having to roll, things like that. In this case, I'm going to take plus one before I act. We might say plus one forward. So Zebo stops. He has a good think. And he remembers a time before he joined the Broken Cask Society when he was out there in the wilds and he came upon a similar situation, except they were sheep, not goats. But the roar worked pretty good. So going back to that memory and considering for a minute, is going to give me plus one on this roll. So we can roll a six side to die. I rolled a two plus one is three. That is not enough to hit. So here are my options now. I can take the hit and um, potentially lose some morale because these goats are going to are not at all impressed by my roar. Or I could spend another point of mirth for a reroll. I don't want to waste that point of mirth. So we're going to go with the consequences. Flipping back to the table, I see that um, in the miss column, it says the beast pounces on you with hate. Acting characters mark XP and take minus one morale. So just like your average Powered by the Apocalypse game, Broken Cask Society usually will give you some experience points when you miss a roll, showing how you kind of learn from your mistakes, kind of fail forward, if you will. So that's nice that I get some experience points. As Zebo blinks, wondering why there was no effect at, from his mighty roar, and then is pounced on by the goats. They leap down off the rocks, their thick goat, goat skulls crashing into the thick trollish skull of Zebo, And Zebo is dazed for quite a while. Has to take a long sit before we're able to head back up the mountain. Now, one thing I did not put on this sheet that 
you will see on your character sheet playbook is a place to mark on the society log where you have successes and where you have failures on the road. This is going to come back later. So you can't see it, but I've marked today's adventure with an X indicating a failure. Unfortunate, because that's going to affect our role at the end of the journey, but we are playing by the rules tonight. All right. So the rest of the day proceeds without much incident. Old Zebo um, finds a good place to camp there in the side of the mountain. Does, you know, a decent bit of rest. Wakes up with an extreme headache because he got jumped by a goat. And that brings us to our next day's adventure. So I'm going to flip back to the tables. I'm going to roll 2d6 again. And we're going to find out what happens next. Uh, 4 plus 1 is 5. 5 on the mountains table says... Steep cliffs stand before you. How do you approach them? This one's a little bit easier. It's only a B5 test. So Zebo wakes up. Um, you'll note I didn't pick the time of day today. So we're going to say it's about mid, mid aft. And Zebo can see there on the other side of the mountains, the town in which the Egridan infant is located, snug in a little curve of the river. But before there, he nearly slips as he meets the cliffs of these mountains. And his big trollish feet don't seem to favor this narrow pathway. Um, so what are we going to do about this? Um, okay. Zebo presses his back to the mountain wall and turns his feet outwards and shuffles alongside, hoping he does not slip. So again, I'm going to roll without a bonus. And I'm going to wait. I can spend that point of mirth to re-roll if I need to. Let's cross our fingers and hope for the best. So we're rolling, like I said, body score is zero. We're looking for a four or higher, which we did not get. So Zebo slips and then goes back in his imagination to find some um, expertise. It says invoke an attribute to re-roll after a test. The two attributes I have are the fact that he's a vengeful sort and he's an adventure seeker. So I think I'm going to go with this. As an adventure seeker, um, Zebo is not a. F f he's familiar with mountains. He spent some time here before. I think specifically there was that time when he was a little. His granny sent him up to the top of the mountain to get a particular herb, which didn't actually grow on that mountain. She just wanted to get him out of the house for the afternoon, and it was very similar to this. And the time spent there gave him some pretty good footing. And so even though he slips, he's able to regain his footing and hopefully not fall as I re-roll. Yes, there we go. So that got me at six. So Zebo makes it. Uh, referring back to the tables, it says, one of the footholds is actually the den of a tiny, helpful sprite. So as Zebo slipped, he reached back, stuck his hand in the hole, and heard a voice say, hey, what are you doing? And a helpful sprite comes out. The rest of the text says, roll on a one to two, they offer to become the acting character's familiar. So the little sprite pops out and says, what's the troll doing up here? In case you missed it, this is the only kind of accent I can do, apparently. So let's roll. We got a two. Excellent. And uh, after a bit of, bit of conversation, the f sprite offers to accompany Zebo. So let's find out what that means. First, we're going to roll to come up with a name for our guy, our new sprite friend. 66 is a d66 table so its name is nico appropriate and if i flip to the rare items table it says a magical familiar can be spent to avoid any test on which they may be able to help you so if i come across a test later and it looks like a sprite companion can help then our new friend nico the sprite can help us to skip that test as if it was a success i should say Okay, so this brings us to Journey's End. Zebo and his new friend, Nico the Sprite, begin to descend the mountain and make their way to the town in which they hope to find the famous Egret and Infant. But first, we must check in with our heroes to see how they're doing. So what we do at Journey's End is we take the successes and the misses, we add them together, and that creates a modifier, and then we roll on the table. So in this case, I had one success and one failure. So my modifier is zero because successes count as plus one. Failures count as minus one. They cancel each other out. So it's just a naked 1d6 roll. I rolled a three. And the table tells me the journey was not too bad, but not a great trip. There's no effect. 
I'll take it. It could have been a lot worse. Oh, I see I also forgot to erase my point of mirth here. It could have been a lot worse. I could have lost morale. I could have had to spend more um, toke gear or things like that. But instead, it says uh, not too bad. I could have also spent my gear. That didn't really come into play during our journey, but it can be spent at journey's end to boost your rolls. If you just get a really nasty roll, you can spend some of this gear to boost it, but I'm okay with a three. So we're going to keep it rolling here. Uh, so now we would roll to learn a little bit more about the inn we've just arrived at, but I'm not going to do that because we're using one of our pre-written inns. So as Nico and Zebo, what a name, approach uh, the e-written infant, they can see that it's a very elegant, polished inn. And stepping inside, they're greeted to a sniff down by Primo the Poodle, who has taken up residence here at the Egret and Infant. It's absolutely luxurious. The wood frame um, beams shimmer because they're so polished. Uh, there's gentle hand-loomed carpets from here and there. Every single table is decorated with a very beautiful purple runner. Um, and it seems like a bit much for a post stop. So this is a legendary level six in, which means you get plus one when you rest, which is really good. However, you always get disadvantage when you um, enjoy a beverage. And worse yet, as a pilgrim, I'm too used to sleeping on the ground. I'm going to take disadvantage, um, excuse me, minus one whenever I rest here. Because old Zebo is just used to sleeping out there in the wild. Sleeping in this posh inn is not really good for him. But that's okay. The specialty, of course, is the Lofty Pint Ale. We'll come back to that later. And now I'm going to roll to find out the arrival event. We'll find out what happens here. So I'll roll 1d6. I've rolled a 5. It says a peddler's here. You may roll on the market table if you wish. You bet I wish. So let's see. I'm going to roll down to the market table. I'm going to roll again. And I rolled myself a little old 3. A gift from the for the next innkeeper. What is it? Take advantage forward on the arrival table. So I've made a note here off screen that I've got a, I found a wonderful, what do innkeepers like? Um, a wonderful deck of enchanted cards. These are big tarot sized playing cards um, with wonderful illustrations on the back that can do a trick when you say the magic words. Now it does say for the next innkeeper, so I can't present this to the current innkeeper, but I'm going to mark that on my playbook so that I can use it in the next session. That's pretty cool. Now that we have arrived and done our event, uh, we can begin to feast. I'm going to move my token that I keep forgetting to move. All right, so here's how the feasting phase works. What you're going to do is start with the special. So the special here at the e and Infant is the ale, so I must try the ale, which is disadvantage. I'm going to make a mark on that. And after that, however, we can mix it up however we want to get a total of six courses um, because this is plus six we're going to take disadvantage on the drink so apart from the ale i think i'm going to stick to the food so we're going to have three entrees we're quite hungry and nico is quite the eater for a sprite and we're going to do a dessert and an all and an app all right made a note there so i imagine stepping into the inn the host looks zebo and Nico up and down and uh, gives them a disdainful look and says, this way, please, and walks them to the far darkened corner table where these vagabonds will not cause too much trouble. Even upon presenting his membership pass, or uh, what do we call it, membership certificate as a member of the Broken Cask Society, doesn't do much to help poor old Zebo. And as the innkeeper walks away, he says, we'll have the ale. And the innkeepers or the uh, the host says, "Of course you will." All right, so we're gonna roll ale here to find out the difficulty. So sometimes, if you use this, is worth noting. If you use the pre-written ends, sometimes they have a difficulty attached to the specialty. Sometimes they don't. If they don't, you just roll on the ale table as usual. So the ale table is the d66. So we roll two dice. Remember, one of those is gonna be the tens place. One of them is gonna be the one place. That's how a d66 works. So I just go left to right. So we've got a 41. 41 on the ale table is the gold tooth golden ale, a B4 ale. So here's how feasting works. Every time we approach a dish, or I should say a dish is brought out to us, a course is brought out to us, we roll, we test just like we did during the adventure phase. Point of this test is to see, do we like this? Do we not like this? Is it gross? Is it good? 
If you do like it, you hit, you get some mirth, because you know what? Good food and drink make you feel good. If you miss, you mark XP, which is good, but then there's a reaction to see what happens. So, as I said, this is the Golden Tooth Golden Ale. Love the redundance. This is a B4 test. So I think what I'm going to do, my B score is still a zero. Um, I'm going to go ahead and use my familiar. So Zebo <laughs> takes a big sniff of the ale. He's not feeling too happy about it. So he slides the big old mug over to Nico. And Nico the Sprite claps their hands together, rubs them together, and just dives in like it's a pool. Because they're a rather sprightly Sprite. And they drink it down and look quite satisfied. And the sight of a Sprite swimming around in a mug of beer is not to be missed. And so that counts as a success for me. And I'm going to mark it as such. Now, one other side rule, optional rule for this game, is the, the Broken Cask Society standings. Now, what is that? That's sort of a meta game you can choose to play with your group or on your own, where you guys are sort of competing with other society members to see who's been exploring the most and trying the most food and generally just being the best. And if you are employing that rule, it is important to mark your hits and misses when you feast. If you're not, don't worry about it. Just do the, what the table tells you to do and you can ignore the score. All right. So just as Ebo is about to say, uh, waiter, to try to get the next meal, the appetizer is brought out. So again, I roll 2d6, then consult the appetizer table. That's a 12. It actually says aperitif in the book because I'm a fancy boy. All right, rolling down to the aperitif table. A 12 is the soup du jour. It's the soup of the day. So the annoyed waiter plops a rather grayish stew down before our heroes. Um, and I forgot to mention, Nico is spent. So when you spend anything in this game, it means it's done. It's out of the game. So after downing that whole massive pint of ale, Nico is patting their tummy and laying listlessly on the table. So Zebo is now on his own. But luckily, this is only an M2 test. Uh, the mind score for the Pilgrim is zero, but a two is pretty easy to get. So Zebo daintily rubs his hands together in pleasure, dips his spoon in there, takes a bite, and it is delicious. Oh, there's notes of barley and some kind of salty seafoodish taste. It's just so good. And he's ready for the next course. And as we said, we're going to do three entrees in a row. So let's go ahead and knock those out real quick. Before you can say Bob's your uncle, the waiter is back with some more food to try. We roll a 32. Consulting the entree table, a 32 is flank steak of quintessence. A little dark stone reference, dark throne reference for those who know. So a steaming slab of meat is brought out before Zebo, who tucks in, rolling again without a bonus, is a five. Oh, it's just delightful. This place is truly living up to its name. And I'm loading up on mirth, so I think the rest of this feast is going to go quite nicely for me. I've got a few more to go. 35. It's the mushroom pie with saffron. Mm, I wish I had one of those in real life. By the way, if you're a backer of the Broken Cask Society, don't forget to check Kickstarter because the free recipes from our friends at the Gluttonous Geek based on the Broken Cask are there for you to download, and they are very cool. All right, so 35, like I said, is the mushroom pie with saffron. That's an M4. And you want to know what? Let's just roll and see what happens. We cut into it. A little bit of mushroomy goodness oozes out. Zebo. Oh, wrong dice. Zebo puts fork to gob and rolls a five. We're doing just fine. So normally I, my, I cap out at three mirth, but because of my special pilgrim move here, I can keep that extra bit of joy there and I mark that on my sheet. Okay, so unless I've lost count, we've only got one more entree to go. It's proven to be a pretty easy way, easy um, game here. Um, it's actually a redo from a live stream I did, and then I accidentally deleted that, <laughs> and I didn't post it. And that game was rough. That game went, went a lot less smooth than this one. There were a lot of misses. All right, so 22 is the Kraken's Ink Zite. That sounds delicious. If you've never had ink pasta, I highly recommend it. This is an M2, so again, we're rolling naked. Is that appropriate? He's rolling naked. We're rolling without a bonus. This one seems a little bit challenging for old Zebo, but he's an adventurous eater. He's not a member of the Broken Cask Society for nothing. 
He rolls a six. My guy, the dice are on my side today. Now, I've had an extremely good run of luck with the dice here. Um, now, normally that doesn't always happen. One critique people have given of the original Broken Cask was that it was kind of easy, and that's intentional. It's meant to be a chill, cozy game. It's kind of the same thing here. Throughout playtesting, I did get lots of feedback about the difficulty. Some people thought it was just right. Some people thought it was too easy. So I did actually bump up the numbers on some of these tests to make them more challenging. I just got lucky. If I had got a more challenging roll, I might accept a miss just to mark XP because it is good to advance, especially because I'm doing real well. I'm not like in any kind of critical spot where it would be really disastrous if I missed a roll. So I may have taken the hit just to get some XP had I rolled it, but I did not. So alas, oh no, I forgot dessert. We still got one more to go. Maybe this will be my big flub. So we're going to roll in the dessert table. Oh boy. Yeah, that's as high as you can go. This is going to be hard. The most challenging dessert of all is, of course, white cake. This is an M7 test. And so just when he thinks he's done, the whole crowd stops. The minstrel that had been playing in the corner stops their music. Everyone turns as the waiter, with a wicked grin on their face, brings out a slice of the infamous white cake. And he sets it down before Zebo and says, enjoy. We don't know what's up with this cake, but we're going to find out. So our friend Zebo screws his courage to the sticking po place. How does that work? Sticking place? Yeah. And he rolls. This is an M7. No help, though I do have tons of points of mirth. Let's see what happens. Roll a one. All right. So like I said, I could use mirth to boost, boost this if I wanted to. I don't want to. I want to take this opportunity to mark some XP. And I also want to um, show you how it works when you fail. So when you miss a roll in the feast table, you mark XP, like I said, and then you head to the react table. This is a naked roll. I rolled a six, which again, dice are on my side. So what this the reaction is, would be something like this. Zebo takes a big scoop of cake and puts it in his mouth and it tastes like sweetened paper with a bit of snail poop on the side. It's not really his thing. So he stomachs it, gets it down because what self-respecting broken cask society member would not. Um, and then the reaction table represents what your character does with that. Sometimes you lose morale because it's just bumming you out because it tastes so bad. Sometimes it makes you physically ill sometimes it's an external consequence like the food wasn't that bad but somebody does something at exactly the wrong moment to spoil this course for me again the dice are on my side i rolled a six which says you managed to stomach it and press on so zebo shakes the taste out of his mouth pats his stomach contentedly and begins to wonder where his room is so again there's more role playing that could be done more stories that could be told but in the interest of time we're going to move on to the last phase of any session of the broken cask which is the rest phase so here's how the rest phase works it's a 1d6 table it is modified by anything that could have happened so there are sometimes some events that you might face on the road that could affect your rest there's some items that could affect your rest there are in events that could affect your rest in this case the only thing that is affecting my rest is my status as a pilgrim so zebo climbs up there finds just a disgustingly tidy room oh it's so annoying how clean it is the sheets are all white and uh it is not at all like the sleep sacks under the stars that zebo is used to um so he's gonna take minus one however once he settles in it is just downy soft it's pure heaven and so the plus one bonus I get from being at a legendary inn actually negates the negative one I would take as a pilgrim. So that's fortuitous. It's a lucky day to be Zebo. So let's roll to find out what happens next. I rolled a three with no modifier. And it says on the rest table, plus one morale or mark XP. I really want to level up. I've only lost one morale on this journey there on the, on the road. So I'm going to mark that XP. Zebo awakes refreshed, smacks his mouth happily, wonders what happened to Nico, and rolls out of bed. Now, at this point in the story, you have options. Again, uh, you can go ahead and end the session now, in which case you just tidy up your um, playbook and set it aside until the next journey. Or you could continue on. You would roll again to find out which inn you're going to go to. Uh, maybe you have another pre-written inn you want to use, and your playbook stays exactly as it is. You just start the whole thing over. The only difference is you're not going to visit the society house. There's no preparation. You just roll a departure event and off you go to the next inn. 
It's entirely up to you. If you do choose to end it, there's also an epilogue table. So I think that's how we're going to end things today to find out the finale of the Epic of Zebo. And again, this is um, one of those tables marked with an asterisk in the book that tells you it's optional. So if you have your own story you want to tell, you've got some headcanon you want to get out there, just go for it. Don't let the game hold you back. But if you want a little inspiration, you can roll on this epilogue table. And number five says, tales of your journey inspire fresh recruits for the society. How do you know them? I think that when Zebo gets back to the Broken Cask Society house, their waiting is a pair of young trolls. The second and third trolls join the society uh, for the story went far and wide of the troll of the Broken Cask Society who faced the, ine the inimitable white cake of the egridden infant and survived. So that's where I'm going to end my story. What you can do next is totally up to you. This game is your oyster. So I hope you enjoy. I hope this video was helpful. I hope you learned a thing or two. And above all else, I hope that the Broken Cask and the Broken Cask Society are bringing you lots of cheerful, cozy, enjoyable gaming moments. If you have any questions, please drop them in the comments below or visit me at shorelessskies.com.